Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Underwood, and I'd like to turn it over to Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. A big thank you to Dave Hatchie, who's going to do the didactic for us today. Dave, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Dave's been part of our expert panel here, and Dave is a professor of pharmacy at Idaho State University. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dave. We'll be going over uh, interactions with uh, over-the-counter medications uh, in herbals. So what I hope that you're able to leave uh, today's presentation with is, first of all, um, recognize the growing complexity of over-the-counter products, brand name extensions, as well as herbal ingredients. And then to build on that, to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the data, albeit limited, surrounding OTC and herbal interactions and sort of why that is. And most, most specifically with regards to antiretroviral therapy. And then the meat and potatoes today is going to be to identify the major interactions that are known and some that are theoretical with antiretrovirals that may lead to either antiretroviral failure or toxicity. So if you've ever walked into a pharmacy um, and uh, gone down the OTC aisle looking for something, you've probably played this game a little bit where you just are walking up and down the aisles looking at these products, looking at ingredients, and it's not an uncommon uh, uh, sight for pharmacists to see. Uh, when you look at it, there are over 300,000 over-the-counter products that are actually available on the market. And when you compare that to the 10,000 prescription products, uh, you know, obviously that, uh, that complicates matters dramatically. Uh, and when you look at the expanding market, there's expanded advertising. And with that, leads to um, uh, a lot more over-the-counter use. And, uh, and recent data suggests that more than 50% of the adult population regularly uses OTC products. And I just ask you to examine, you know, your lifestyle in the last month. Uh, you know, have you had to use any OTC products? And, and again, if so, how far did you actually go to look at ingredients and things of that nature? Uh, in addition to the expanding OTC market, there are issues that have arisen. Um, and that's, that's referred to as this brand name extension. So when you look at acetaminophen nowadays, it's not just Tylenol. It's Tylenol, Tylenol extra strength, Tylenol arthritis, Tylenol PM. So with that, that builds this complexity of, well, with the new regulations of how much Tylenol you should be getting on a daily basis, is this too much? Is it, is it not enough? Is it okay to take these products together? So the health literacy of uh, the general population can lead to problems with this. Other brand name extensions, Pepto-Bismol, for example. You probably remember Pepto as bismuth subsalicylate. However, there's children's Pepto now. That's just plain calcium. When you look at aspirin products, Excedrin, Excedrin migraine, all of those may have something different, may have aspirin, acetaminophen, and caffeine. So there's different products that, uh, that can complicate that. And I don't even want to get into the cough and cold products because that's just, I mean, it's just a huge mess. And the last thing that has led to this expanding OTC market is what we call prescription to OTC conversion, where you take a drug such as Prilosec. It used to be prescription only. FDA looks at it, says it would be safe in general population, and that has moved. So for those of you that are younger, probably don't remember a lot of these products being prescription. All the H2 receptor antagonists started out as prescription. Um, most recently, things like Miralax, um, non-sedating antihistamine, all those used to be prescription only. But in the FDA's defense, one of the things um, that has tried to move to um, over-the-counter has been statins. Mevacor has tried three times, Merck has tried three times to move Mevacor over-the-counter and has failed. So thank goodness from that, from a drug interaction standpoint. So herbal medications and natural medications are sort of this um, homogeneous cluster that is a little bit different than OTCs. OTCs uh, go through more of a regulatory process to be approved. OCT, uh, naturals and herbals don't. And again, it's very similar data. About 50% of the adult population have tried or actually used these on a somewhat regular basis. And so when we look at this, um, we had this split in the 1960s with thalidomide. So if you remember the focophilia with thalidomide, um, that was with over-the-counter um, nausea medications. So what regulation has come of that is that herbals are actually classified as food and supplements, not as over-the-counter medications. 
So with that, um, a lot of safety data um, is, is unknown. Uh, so with that, when we look at herbals as well, a lot of people assume, oh, they're safe, they're natural. When in fact, if you look at the history, a lot of herbals have actually been removed from the market. Things like kava kava, ephedra. Um, also, most recently, and I have this Zycam product up there. Uh, if you remember about a year or two ago, the Zycam nasal swabs were pulled from the market because people were losing their sense of smell. So yeah, that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a bad side effect. So, from that perspective, there are still Zycam products out there, and they can actually make claims, such as gets rid of your cold faster, it's an immune booster, it's prostate health, whatever they want to put on it, but there also has to be specific information that they say, this product is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure illnesses. Um, and again, taking advantage of low health literacy, people come up and say, say to me sometimes, oh, airborne, look at airborne, it, it prevents colds. It was developed by a teacher. Well, what does that matter? So it's, it really appeals to emotion and appeals to their sense of naivety. Now, when we take this information and look at the drug interaction data between OTCs and herbals, again, um, it's very limited. And for OTCs to be available on the market, there is less extensive interaction studies when compared to prescription products. And again, the drug interaction data that we have is really available from one of two resources. First of all, those drugs have gone from prescription to OTC. We have all that prescription pharmacokinetic data, which is great. Other than that, it's really just independent pharmacokinetic studies. It is case uh, reports, and some of it is theoretical in nature as well. And then herbs on the other side are even less known, where when you look at the herbal drug interaction data, Again, being dietary supplements, there's no real reason or need to study them, uh, and we'll look at some of the more known interactions between those. So with that brief introduction, I want to get into the specific interactions that are known between OTCs and herbals. So the first one are our proton pump inhibitors, and these are probably, uh, probably the most concerning and most known. And the two proton pump inhibitors that are available over the counter include Prilosec and Lansoprazole. And when we look at these, these are our most potent acid suppressing drugs. They maintain GI pH above 4 for at least 24 hours. And there are two major drug, drugs that interact with our PPIs, Ropivirine and Atazanavir. And the absolute contraindication um, between these agents is with Ropivirine and the PPIs because the PPIs decrease the absorption and bioavailability of ropivirine, essentially decreases those serum concentrations enough where the drug has no effective action on the virus. When we look at PPIs with atazanavir, again, atazanavir requires an acidic environment to absorb, and therefore, which we don't do a lot of, but if patients have unboosted atazanavir, that is not recommended to be um, co-administered with a PPI. Then when we boost, and again, most of the time we're boosting our atazanavir, when we do that in naive patients, so patients with essentially a, a clear genotype and, and never been on therapy, it's okay to give a PPI. However, the dose should not exceed more than 20 milligrams of omeprazole or an equivalent. It should be dosed about 12 hours apart. When you look at patients that are PI experienced, it's generally not recommended to give a PI uh, if somebody's on any form of atazanavir. The next step down in our uh, acid suppressing are H2 blockers. Um, they're less potent, but still can maintain GI pH, you know, three or four for, you know, about 12 hours or so. So with that, the restrictions are less severe, but still can lessen the effectiveness of drug therapy. The, the recommendations with ropilverine that if you do need to use an H2 blocker, you dose it either 12 hours before or four hours after the ropilverine. And that allows for enough ropivirine to be absorbed for it to be effective. With atazanavir, as you can see, it's a bit more convoluted and complex. But the bottom line is that you can use an H2 blocker and about an equivalent of 20 milligrams of famotidine for an ind individual dose or 20 milligrams twice a day. You should give your atazanavir at least two hours before or 10 hours after the um, H2 blocker. And if you're boosting it, you can go a little bit higher with your H2 blocker, but again, this is where it gets a little bit convoluted with um, patients who are, are experienced, and should you increase your atazanavir dose to 400, 100 if they're on tenofovir, because tenofovir can lower your atazanavir, 
the bottom line with this is that if you have a patient that needs acid suppressing therapy, you should probably avoid your atazanavir and ropivirine. And if you do need to use it, use your lowest effective dose and double check the separation of the two products. And finally, the antacids. And again, we're looking at products such as kaopectate, malox, and mylanta that contain various ingredients such as aluminum, magnesium, bismuth, and calcium. And these agents as well can lower the effectiveness of the ropivirine and atazanavir, but again, to a lesser extent. With ropivirine, dosing antacids a couple hours before or four hours after, and with atazanavir, given the antacids a couple hours before or one hour after, will ensure absorption. So again, the takeaway point with all these acid suppressing drugs is to use lowest effective dose if possible to avoid the, the decrease in drug levels of your um, antiretroviral, or look at other options. Is the patient a surgical candidate? Does the patient warrant a change in their uh, HIV therapy to accommodate their, their acid suppressing agents? And that's kind of the, the struggles that we've faced with our patients. So now on to herbals. St. John's wort is really the major one that keeps coming to the surface. And St. John's wort is commonly used as an antidepressant. It's thought to have mixed actions, much like a tricyclic or monoamine oxidase inhibitor, a bit of serotonin as well. But from pharmacokinetic standpoint, it's well known to induce the cytochrome P450 system. So in doing that, it markedly accelerates the metabolism of pretty much all your protease inhibitors and your NNRTIs, making them useless. And with the new addition on the market of Strybild with Elvitegravir and Clobacistat, those drugs also have lower drug levels when combined with, when combined with St. John's Ward. So again, the takeaway message is trying to talk to patients and educate them about this interaction, avoid this interaction by either removing this drug and supplementing with prescription antidepressants or counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, this time of year, seasonal affective disorder, light therapy, things of that nature. Now, I slid this, uh, slid this one in there today. This was uh, crofelomer. This is uh, a new drug. It's actually a botanical. And it was just approved by the FDA yesterday. So it's the second botanical ever to be approved by the FDA. So even though it's an herbal, it's not over the counter, and it's gone through more rigorous studies to come to market. So this prescription's uh, indicated for the symptomatic release of relief of non-infectious diarrhea in HIV patients on antiretrovirals. It's thought to be locally acting. It's not absorbed into the bloodstream. So no major uh, pharmacokinetic interactions with the cytochrome P450 system, but yet, you know, whether or not it decreases some of the absorption of other agents, don't necessarily know. I haven't been able to dive deep into the pharmacokinetic data. But it was studied in patients, obviously, on ARVs. No patients had marketed breakthrough in uh, viremia. So uh, again, with that, this is just came on the market or came uh, available yesterday from the FDA. And, uh, and again, we'll be hearing more on it in a couple uh, in a couple weeks. The last thing uh, I want to leave you with is sort of this hodgepodge. So there are other products, uh, grapefruit juice. This is a notable uh, cytochrome P450 3A4 inhibitor, so it can increase levels of certain antiretrovirals. Very few pharmacokinetic studies, so generally we use it with caution. Ginkgo uh, is a is another medication that a lot of people will use for memory. However, it has antiplatelet effects, and nowadays with a lot of our HIV patients on aspirin or antiplatelet agents, increased risk of bleeding. There's also this growing class of agents called behind-the-counter, so things like morning-after pill. Some states uh, require pseudoephedrine to be kept behind-the-counter. Insulin, those types of products can certainly be used and without you knowing your patient's actually taking them. A lot of our patients here in Idaho, and I'm sure in Seattle as well, get products from Canadian pharmacy online shopping, so risk of uh, purchasing things like erectile dysfunction drugs with lots of significant drug interactions uh, are also of concern. So bottom line, really talk to your patients and find out what they're taking. Because when you say, what drugs are you taking, they don't think of herbals, OTCs, and things they're getting from Canada or their friends as, as drugs. So just to bring this back home, hopefully uh, you're able to appreciate the fact that OTCs and natural medicines really uh, constitute this large portion of self-treatment in the adult population, which you as a medical provider may not be aware of. Also, I hope you're able to realize that these OTC and natural medication interactions really haven't been studied. And a lot of this is theory that we're going on. 
And lastly, remembering these sort of well-identified interactions between atazanavir and rupivirine with our acid-suppressing agents, and knowing that St. John's wort is a big no-no. And lastly, asking your patients what they're taking. Prescription, non-prescription, illicit, recreational, whatever label you want to put on a drug, anything they're ingesting, ask them about it. With that, I'll certainly uh, uh, entertain any discussion or questions.